Uh, Exodus chapter number 32, if you'll find your place there and then stand with us for the reading of the scripture tonight. <clears throat> Exodus 32, uh, look with me please at verse number 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Preadventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord. You remember the last time that he was with the Lord, the Lord was very, very angry. And now he's got to go back and face God and try to calm the Spirit of God. Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. It's good to start with an admission of guilt. And have made them gods of gold. Certainly God knew that. Verse 32, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them, pending judgment. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Uh, look at uh, chapter 33, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee and will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments, for the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are stiff necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of the ornaments by Mount Horeb. Father, thank you for the time that we have together tonight. I pray you'll be mighty in our midst. Thank you for what you've already done. May our heart be close to Thee even now. And Lord, may we be thinking about the work that we want You to do in our heart. May You find a reception. May You find a welcome tonight. May You not have any kind of resistance from any of us. May we be open to what You want to do. We love You. Thank You now, Father, for what You will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thanks for standing. The question that's uh, maybe on the table and in the minds of these people is whether God's going to go. I want to show you something tonight that I'd never seen before that the Lord showed to me that's been a, a very sobering thought for me about uh, this passage of Scripture. I enjoy the book of Exodus and went through it many, many times. I love the book. It's one of my favorite in the Bible. So much richness in these passages of Scripture. I want to show you something tonight. I'll show you a little bit from chapter 32 and chapter 33 that the Lord showed me recently. And pray to be a blessing to you with the thought of revival on our minds and in our hearts. I'll take you back to chapter 32. And you know this story, I trust, if you've been in church any amount of time to understand that the children of Israel had sinned a great sin. In chapter number 32, at the beginning, as Moses went up into the mount to meet with God, 
the people came to Aaron and said, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron uh, told them to break off the golden earrings, bring those uh, jewels to him. The Bible says that they did as he had asked. In verse number four, it said he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And we see the mixing, if you will, of religion with humanism and worldliness and all uh, a manner of filth. Amen. The Bible gives us the understanding that the people rose up early in the morning and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord uh, sees and hears what's going on down below and he tells Moses, get, go, get thee down for thy people. Notice how God distanced himself from these people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt. He didn't even want anything to do with the credit of bringing them out of Egypt. He gave it to Moses, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them that they, they have made them a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed thereunto. And I said, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a, a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And of course, Moses talks to God and tries to calm God down at that point in time. Look at Exodus chapter 20, if you would, and hold your place there. Exodus chapter number 20, and uh, I want to take you to another uh, moment in time on their journey as they were given what we uh, call the Ten Commandments. As it was spoken to them, Exodus in chapter number 20. There's several details that you and I can study out of this passage of Scripture to help us to understand uh, what took place at this moment in time. Notice uh, uh, the command of God, verse number one of chapter 20, God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Notice here, he takes the credit for doing it out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'd say that's pretty clear. Thou shalt not make unto thee any uh, graven image, once again, very clear, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, clear. All that is in the water or under the, under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Notice God sees that when you worship another God, you hate him. And by the way, that's not an emotion. It's a turning. It's a turning your back on God or turning your face toward God, one of the other. Now think about God handing off the scripture. Go back with me, if you would, to chapter number 32. He hands off uh, the scripture that's given there. He hands that off to Moses as Moses is up in the mount. And uh, he's with God all of this amount of time. And he hands those scriptures off to Moses and Moses has those in his hand. We know when he comes down the mountain, he sees what's taking place. He sees it with his own eyes. He takes those scriptures and he throws them down on the ground and they break. Even as the music is beginning to play, the scripture, the word of God is being given to Moses. Their actions, if you will, put an incredible distance between them and God, that God and his people are separated because of their disobedience. It's driven a wedge as they cheat on God. God hearing uh, and seeing what these people are doing and how they are reacting and how they're responding through chapter number 32, if you will. As you come to chapter number 33, one must wonder, is the plan of God still going to go forward? 
I'm going to I'm going to get rid of these people. I'm going to consume them and I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to scrap this plan and I'm going to start all over again. That's the conversation that's on the table. As you get to the end of chapter number 32, you get to verse number uh, 32 of 32. Now, yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he's pleading with God. He's going back to talk to God and uh, seeing now what the people have done and, and God uh, using this minister in service to himself. Uh, Moses is a pastor of these people. Uh, he goes down and he deals with these people as best he can. Then he goes back and he talks to God. And, and this is the first conversation he has with God. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And then you see the line. Your Bible, as you see that long line, I would have you to notice tonight, that's a pause. No other way could it be described to us or communicated to us other than that God would give a line there. And that line is, is this, he has said this to God. He's waiting on a response from God. But God doesn't say anything. If thou wilt forgive their sin. Perhaps Moses is collecting his own thoughts because of what he's about to say. Notice what the pastor says. Ministering on behalf of these people to God. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. Do away with me. Wow. There's a disharmony that's here and Moses certainly understands it. I would have you to notice, if you will, that the uh, promised land uh, plan is seemingly still in place as God says, OK, look at verse 34. Therefore, now go lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto them. Behold, notice this, mine angel, capital A, angel shall go. But then as we get into chapter number uh, 33, notice, if you will, and the Lord said unto Moses, depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt unto a land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to keep my promise. I made a promise. I'm going to keep my promise. And I will send an angel, little a angel, I'm going to send a surrogate with you. I'm not going to go myself, but I'm going to send a surrogate with you. Wow. As if God was saying, look, I made a promise. I'm going to keep the promise. But as far as Exodus chapter number 25 and verse number eight, where I said that there was a, a place that I wanted to make, a tabernacle that I wanted to make where I could come down personally and dwell with them. That plans off. You can forget about the tabernacle. Let me make a sanctuary that I may dwell, that I, that I, God, may dwell amongst them. God's not going. I'll send a surrogate with you, but I'm not going to go. God said, if I come into the midst of these people, I'll consume them. If I get around them, I'll destroy them. They're a stiff necked people. I don't want anything to do with these people. A stiff-necked and unbroken people, a hard-hearted people, uncooperative in every way. I, I'm tired. I want to disassociate myself from these stiff-necked people. That's what they become known as. It's their M.O. I won't take the time for it tonight, but God says in multiple places, if you will, that they were a stiff-necked people. I don't want anything to do with these people. They can't be moved. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff that, I, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. 
of these stiff-necked people. They certainly needed a spiritual adjustment. God said, I don't want anything to do with these people. They won't listen to my, uh, they won't listen to my instructions. And Moses, obviously, hearing all of this, and certainly in his mind and in his heart, what do I do? He already had denied the idea of God taking and destroying these people and making of him a great nation. He distanced himself from it. Don't do that, God. And then there is, if you will, the command that was given to take off the ornaments. And I thought about that. I was meditating on that. And you realize uh, with regards to ornaments, ornaments are trappings. They're, uh, they're jewelry, they're those types of things that might be accessories that someone would give to someone that they love. An outward decoration, if you will, to dress uh, somebody up in. I won't take time for it tonight, but Ezekiel chapter number 16 speaks about, gives the idea how God dressed them in ornaments. Your daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you with scarlet, who, uh, with uh, other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon their apparel. It was a sign of somebody that was loved. Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 7 and verse number 11 speaks about, he said, I took you and he said, I, I decked you with ornaments. I gave you, if you will, these things so that other people would know uh, that you were loved, that God had decked them with those trappings and bracelets and necklaces. It was a sign that a woman was favored. It was a sign that she was adored. When a man buys jewelry for his wife, it's a sign that, the, that this woman is loved. Somebody cares about her. We still use that today. That when they came out of Egypt, he, he said, listen, he says, I'm going to give you favor in the sight of the Egyptians and you're going to uh, take those jewels of gold and those jewels of silver and put them on you and that you'll have those as a sign uh, that you're loved. And they took those things off and they began to put them into the fire to make a God. And so as God is saying this in this passage of Scripture, as he's telling them, you take those ornaments off of you. You take them off of you right now. I don't want to see them on you because I don't know who you're wearing them for. Are you wearing them for me? Or for your other God? Stiff-necked people. Who gets the credit for the ornaments that you're wearing? Take them off. So the people took them off. I'd say that there was probably an eerie feeling that was taking place in the camp. There had been several funerals and uh, thousands of graves that had been dug. I'd say that the countenance of the people was very sobered and very somber. Moses didn't deny, he didn't question, he didn't debate, he didn't argue with God about the condition of the people. But I want you to notice, if you will, tonight his response. The Lord said unto Moses, verse number five, say unto the children of Israel, ye are a stiff-necked people, I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. Get those things off till I decide what I'm going to do next. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Notice verse 7. As the people were taking off the ornaments, Moses took the tabernacle. And he pitched it without the camp. Far off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord, went up, went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. God's work, words spoke to Moses' heart. He realized that God had turned against these people. He heard uh, God say that the tabernacle uh, plan was put on hold. He heard that. He understood that God was not planning to go with them. He heard God say that. That God was not uh, going to be able to be in the midst of these people lest he, uh, lest he consume them. Which means make a clean rid uh, riddance of. You, you probably have heard people uh, use that uh, phrase, good riddance. Have you ever heard that before? Good riddance. 
It especially expresses a relief that someone or something has gone. Good riddance to you. I'm relieved of you now. I'm not going to be burdened with you anymore. Get out of my sight. So I figure out what I'm going to do next. While the people stripped off themselves of these ornaments, Moses set up the tent. It's such a powerful picture for me as he separated himself from the stiff-necked people. And he went out of the camp. He came out from among them. He was a separate from them and got in the right position. And Moses called the tabernacle what God had named it. I like that. As I think about that, I think about him saying the tabernacle of the congregation. Remember, God, you're the one that called it that. Remember when you first started talking about this tabernacle? You called it the tabernacle of the congregation first. He just repeated what God had said earlier. But please keep in mind that this is the first meeting in this tabernacle. It hasn't been set up before. It's the first meeting that's going to take place before the tabernacle is complete and everything is put in it, all the furniture and all those things that Moses broke in the tabernacle with a good old-fashioned prayer meeting designed to get into the presence of Almighty God before they journeyed, any, uh, journeyed into the promised land. Draw nigh unto God and He'll draw nigh unto you. Back in chapter number 25, hold your place. We just look at some of the words that were given about the intent for this particular place. We hear the conversation that he is going to take this unfinished tent out of the camp and he's going to go inside of it and he's going to begin to talk to God that he wanted God to hear the sound of a conversation inside of that tent. Notice, if you will, verse number 18 of chapter 25, and thou shalt make... Two cherubims of gold of beaten work shalt thou make them and the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub uh, on the one side and the other cherub on the other, uh, other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on, on the two, si two ends thereof. And the cherubim sh shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the face of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat ab above a upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon uh, the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So he begins to talk to the Lord as he goes inside of this tent as he sets it up and Moses begins to have a conversation. I can hear him talking to God and saying, God, please don't scrap this tabernacle plan uh, that you put together. Remember, you wanted a place where you could meet uh, with us, that you wanted a place where you could talk with us. And I, I, I can hear him going inside that tent is he's letting God hear the acoustics of a man calling out to God and saying, God, this is what it sounds like. Remember the labor and the reflection that you're going to be able to see? Uh, God, here's where the bowls are going to go and here's where the spoons are going to go and here's where the holy, holy cups are going to be able to be placed. And uh, God, these are your designs and this is the dimension that you laid out. And, and perhaps he's walking from one place to another and talking about where the furniture is going to go and he begins to talk about where the showbread is going to sit and he speaks to God. God about where the ark is going to be and then he speaks about the veil and he speaks about maybe the holy of holies and I can see him going in there and calling out to God and saying hey this is where the high priest is going to meet with you this is where your man is going to stand as he represents you and, and as he goes there and he mediates between the people and you God this is where the mercy seat's going to be God remember this was your idea about the mercy the mercy seat Remember God, this is the place and these are your people. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. 
Look at verse number 10 of Exodus 33. Moses' action as he enters into the tent. Verse number nine, it says, It came to pass, and Moses entered into the tabernacle. The cloudy pillar descended, stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshiped. Every man in his tent door. Notice as Moses got in there and started talking to God, the people began to worship God. They understood they needed to turn back to God. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Perhaps we could say sitting over in the corner, just kind of watching as his leader talked with God. He's watching the whole thing. And when Moses goes out of the tent, Joshua stays. He said, I want to stay on a while. You ever wanted to just stay on a while? Have you gone without the camp and set up a tent? You know, in order for there to be a revival, someone's going to have to go without the camp and set up a tent. What's your stiff-neckedness tonight? We each most likely have a really good idea about the area of our life where we have failed to yield unto God, where we've been just a little stiff-necked. You know where yours is at. That little area where God says, uh, I want you to change. And you refused. What's your stiff-neckedness all about tonight? See, a lot of times when it comes to things like this, as we ask this question about setting up the tent, it's just talk. So that's what David came into as he came into the camp and everybody's just talking about if somebody went up against Goliath, but nobody was doing anything about it. And a lot of times that's the way revival is. There's a lot of people talking about, boy, if we did this and if we, boy, if we got together and we did that, and we're going to get together for a couple nights and we're going to have a revival meeting. Are we? Or are we just going to talk about revival? It makes for good conversation, especially when hearts are hard and necks are stiff. In order for there to be revival, there's got to be a pursuit of it. Only God can send revival. But he's looking for somebody to set aside all their gods. As Samuel talked to the people, he says, put away your gods and serve the Lord only. Put yourself in the position where God would grant your revival. But it can't just be talk. We've got to separate ourselves. Maybe some prayer retreats and some fasting and some personal affliction and saying no to the flesh and losing some sleep and getting up early, turning off the world and tuning into God. Because we want revival. We truly want it. We're not just talking about it because we know we need God. And we need God to go with us. And Moses knew, he understood. God, look, there's a gap between you and us. And you've got to go with us, God. We want you to go with us. Uh, uh, God, will you be willing to go with us? Because the second part of this uh, conversation solidifies what we're talking about here. I'd have you to go uh, with me to verse number 12. This is the tabernacle conversation. Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. You haven't told me who you're going to, who's going to go. He's referencing uh, back in verse number two about the little A angel. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. You said, I found grace in your sight, Lord. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, 
that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. Uh, God, let's go back to when this people was your people. He said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. Boy, that was good words. He said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. If you don't go, God, I don't want to go. If you're not going, if you're not going to be a part of this tabernacle, uh, God, I don't want to go either. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? How are you going to prove that to us? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, and I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. How are you going to prove it to us unless you go with us, God? That we found grace in your eyes. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Oh, this is good. He comes face to face with God, friend with friend, having a conversation. He says, if I've found a grace in thy sight, show me thy glory. And God said, you've, so, you've found grace in my sight. And Moses said, if I have, prove it to me. Show me your glory. Show me your splendor. Show me your beauty. That's what he's saying. Now think with me about this and understand that when someone waxes hot as God has waxed hot, I want to say to you, they show you an ugly side of themselves. We've heard it talked about the terror of the Lord. Uh, Things can get ugly real fast when somebody's uh, wrath waxes very hot and they say, I'm going to consume you. And so the words that are given here, God, uh, take away the ugliness that you've shown us and show me your beauty. I want to see your beauty. God, take this ugliness away. By the way, when he was asking, he wasn't asking for a little bit. He's begging for a lot. He's saying to him, show me thy copiousness. A yielding, if you will, of something abundantly like a copious harvest that's given, which is to say, give me an abundance, give me a profuse amount, to give me a lavish portion of thy beauty. Give me an overwhelming amount of thy glory. That's what I want to see. Show me thy splendor. Show me thy beauty. Show me your uh, majesty. Uh, Show me your grace. Make it plentiful, God. Show me all of it. Often when we go to God, and please listen to this very carefully, we get exactly what we went to get. A small amount. Because that's what you went for. It it hit me as I was looking at this and saying uh, to my own heart, when you get a small amount, Shannon, it's because you're coming casually to God. And God gives you exactly what you came for. When we go to meet with God, usually the problem is with our wishful expectation that doesn't meet our effort. We want a whole lot, but we really only go with a little bitty cup. Just like with the woman who went with her sons and says, go and ask and get all the pails and pots that you possibly can. It was there. It was lavish. It was it was abundant as long as they had something to put it in. But when uh, they ran out of pots, they ran out of the glory of it. What are you going to God with? Just a little tin cup. Lord, we'd like to have a revival if you could put it in this teeny tiny little thimble. Fill it up, Lord. Fill my thimble, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. Fill this teeny tiny thirsting of my soul. And God said, that's all you want. Church, that's all you want. Mm -hmm. 
sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. He walks into God and he says, come on, come on. I want a, I want a lavish amount. I want a huge portion of thy glory. Come on. A heavy amount of your glory. I want to bask in it. I want to delight in it. I want to be submerged in it. God, I want to, I want to suffocate in it. Please, God, I beg you, make it an overwhelming amount. Give me a, a full dose of my glory. And God said, you couldn't handle it and live. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see my face and live. He said, you can't handle all of it. You understand what Moses was asking for? If God wasn't going, he wanted to die. I don't want to live if you're not going to go, God. If you don't go, I don't want to go. Tonight, I have four things I'll give to you very quickly. You can write them down or not. Tonight we get what we came for. God will only give us what we can handle. We must be in the right position and place as God passes by. And we should be ready to spend His glory well and not waste the opportunity on ourselves. Because oftentimes that's what happens. When God gives us something, we waste it on ourselves. I will say to you tonight, Moses was able to rekindle God's flame. Because of his sacrificial, humble attitude in coming to the Lord, he was able to rekindle the fire of God. Can you do that? Do you have a tabernacle that you can spread? Will you stay until his glory comes? Will you set up the tent? Will you call out Kabod? Moses met with God and the people took off their ornaments. They all got in the right position, if you will. Because Moses said, you know what? Let's get this tabernacle up. I want God to see what it looks like standing up. I want to see, I want God to see, I want God to hear what it sounds like with somebody uh, walking around in it. He said, I, all the plans and everything that's in place, I want God to have the tabernacle that he designed. Let me ask you a question tonight. Does God have the tabernacle he designed for you and him? You are his building. You're his tabernacle. The Holy Spirit of God coming, he comes to you. Let me ask you a question. The dimensions and the design that God set up for you, does God have all of it? Is all the furniture in place? Is, is everything in the position, the showbread where it belongs? Is the ark where it goes? In your heart? Is, is there a meeting of God and the holy of holies of your heart? On a regular basis? Is the tent set up? Or when God shows up, is it laying there on the ground? Is there a room? Is there a conversation? Do you walk in and start calling out, Come on! Come on, Father! Show me that glory. A lavish amount. 
The problem with too many Christians is, is that there's no place for God to meet with them. And there's no place to commute. And then Moses in his thinking, he goes, oh, quick, quick, get the, get the tent set up. Let's, let's get it without the camp. Well, yeah, all the stuff isn't made for it yet. No matter, get the tent set up. I walk around in there and I want to talk to him. We'll move all that stuff in later. I just want to experience his glory. Does God have all of you that he wants? I put it in my notes this way. Tell him you want him to have full access to all the dimensions and all the aspects of your tabernacle. Let him know with you that you'll help to clean out all the golden calves. You won't have him in there with them. You don't want him to do less than he intended to do with your life. You don't want a surrogate, but that you want to go forward with him and let him have all the desires of his heart regarding his plan for your life. Is that true for you? I have a feeling tonight that there's too many Christians, if you will, that there's a tabernacle that God designed whereby he wanted to have full access of you. And he doesn't have it. And all the service of the tabernacle, all the service of this, we don't have time for all of that that's given to us, but all the service of the tabernacle and all of those many different things that God had planned out and designed. And maybe we, we haven't even got the tent up yet. Chapter number 40, once they got it finished, the glory of the Lord came in and it was so thick that man couldn't even get in there. Did you see it? Look at chapter 40 for just a moment. We'll close with this thought. Every piece, everything that God designed was in the exact right place. The, the incense and the tables and the laver and all of these many different things that they could wash thereat and the cleansing and the cleaning and everything that was done. And he reared up the court, verse 33, around about the tabernacle and the altar. He set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Amen. Wouldn't you love to have that just once in your own life? Isn't it time to set up the tent? Father, thank you tonight for the time that we uh, have together. Oh, and that word's been on my mind today, kabod. I'd love to in our meeting this week, Lord, for your glory to show up in such a powerful way. We need you tonight. I pray there's not a person on the sound of my voice right now that would be quick to go away from these thoughts, but Lord, that all of us would run to you and maybe ask you tonight about our own stiff-neckedness and what area of our life our neck is stiff. Pray we would turn to you tonight in every way, completely. And we would beg for your glory that the service of the tabernacle might be busy with the work of God. The Holy Spirit of God, no doubt, is in us. 
Might there be room for thy glory tonight. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I pray you'll run to the Lord tonight in your heart. Would you speak to him tonight? Play through softly for us, would you please? think you need revival tonight. Stand with me if you would, please. Maybe you're of the opinion and thinking you don't need revival. You certainly won't find what you're not seeking for. Revival for Coastal Light is for somebody else. It's not for you. Your relationship is so that everything is what it needs to be. Is that you tonight? One or the other is true. Are we casual or indifferent toward a reviving of God? You'll have as much God as you want. And he'll have as much of you as you give him. You came with a thimble. You didn't come for much. Don't take long to fill that. Wonder why our churches don't have revival. Make him wait until we're good and ready. Lord, help us. We set up the tent tonight.